I'm Scott Harris, Executive Director of Museums at the University of Mary Washington, and we're here today at one of those institutions, the James Monroe Museum in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Our conversation will examine the relationship between Alexander Hamilton and James Monroe. In particular, we'll look at one of the most provocative episodes in that relationship, the Hamilton Reynolds affair. Monroe and Hamilton hailed from distinctly different backgrounds. Uh, they came of age during the American Revolution and went on to careers of major importance in the subsequent evolution of our country's early national period. They met when both served in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. Each saw combat, Monroe most famously at Trenton, where a Hessian musket ball wounded him, nearly cost him his life, and remained in his body for the rest of that life. The trial by fire for Hamilton came at Yorktown, where the battalions he led in a desperate nighttime assault ultimately compelled the surrender of the British forces and, in effect, produced the end of the American Revolution. James Monroe's participation in public life encompassed more than 50 years, taking him from military service to offices in local, state, and federal government, as well as diplomatic postings abroad. He identified politically with the tenets of the Democratic Republican Party founded by his mentor and friend, Thomas Jefferson. And the apex of Monroe's career came in the two terms that he served as the fifth president of the United States. He left his mark on several milestones of American history, including the Louisiana Purchase, the Missouri Compromise, and the foreign policy statement that bears his name, the Monroe Doctrine. Alexander Hamilton, too, played a major part in early politics, government, and economics. As one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, he helped make the case for adoption of the United States Constitution. His service as Treasury Secretary in the administration of George Washington laid the foundations of the American monetary system, and his influence on administration policies at home and abroad were part of the definition of the Federalist Party. In contrast to the extended career of Monroe, Hamilton's contributions to public life ended in 1804 with the ending of his life as a result of the famous or infamous duel he had with Aaron Burr. To help us take a closer look at the political interactions between James Monroe and Alexander Hamilton, we are honored to have back in our museum Joanne Freeman, the class of 1954 professor of American History and American Studies at Yale University. Dr. Freeman, who earned her PhD at the University of Virginia, Wahoo Wah, specializes in the politics and political culture of the revolutionary and early national periods in American history. Her numerous contributions to the field include public lectures, television documentaries, scholarly articles, and two critically acclaimed books. Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, published in 2001, examines the role of personal honor and the culture of dueling in the political process. It also provided inspiration for the Ten Dual Commandments song uh, in a somewhat popular Broadway musical. I th Hamilton? Is that, I think, yeah, the name's Hamilton. Dr. Freeman's most recent book, The Field of Blood, Congressional Violence and Antebellum America, explores the physical violence that was prevalent in the U.S. Congress between 1830 and the Civil War, and what it suggests about the institution of Congress, the nature of American sectionalism, the challenges of the young nation's developing democracy, and the uh, long-standing roots leading to the Civil War. Welcome back to Fredericksburg, Joanne Friedman. Well, thanks for having me back. It's a real pleasure to be able to uh, have you interacting under the watchful gaze of James Monroe. So yeah, it's a little daunting. He's our hall monitor. <laughs> yeah, he'll be, he'll be keeping an eye on us. Um, we'd like to set the stage sort of broadly uh, with a, a, a sort of a general look at if you could characterize the political agendas of what we would call the parties, the Federalist Party, the Democratic Republicans, or Republicans as they were known then, how did they define the domestic and political or uh, foreign policy debates of our early republic? Okay, so the first thing I'll say is I wouldn't call them parties yeah. because we think about parties as these organized, disciplined things, and you know everyone assumes you're a party member. That generation, Hamilton and Monroe's generation, thought that essentially parties were a bad thing. They were a sign that uh, people had grouped together to benefit themselves and not the general good. And I will not discuss whether that's accurate or not of what a party is, but either way, they assumed that they were like-minded men, and of course it was men, yeah. who had come together to instill some kind of vision of the country you know, that they thought was best for the country. Of course, 
personal interests were involved as well. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of informal, but they're groupings. So there's like, a, when I teach this, I talk about two umbrellas. There's like a Federalist umbrella and a Republican umbrella. And you know, people are kind of grouped under it, but there's, there's not one thing mm -hmm. that they all are. So Hamilton is the Federalist. And the Federalists basically really favored a strong central government. Uh, and Hamilton was leading the pack. Actually, Hamilton really early on was one of the first people to step forward during the revolution and say, you know, we gotta strengthen this government. We have to you know, really make it stronger. So he was a nationalist on, in that way really early on and then never stopped. Right. So the Federalists want that, that strong central government they kind of, in a sense, were looking towards Europe or European empires. They were thinking manufacturing, they were thinking cities, they were thinking sophisticated trade. They were, they were envisioning the United States as a sophisticated but ideally somewhat more virtuous version of what they could see mm -hmm. over the sea. And they were friendly towards England. Not surprisingly, they looked towards England, admired England. Hamilton once said that the British government was the finest government on the face of the earth. Uh, said a man who had fought against it. Yeah, yes. exactly. And that, that did not calm people down once the government started. But at any rate, that's where the Federalists stood. The Republicans, and Jefferson and Monroe and James Madison are in that camp, mm -hmm. uh, really had a more agrarian view of what the nation should be. They, you know, Jefferson particularly liked to wax about the yeoman farmer, but their vision really was uh, cities were not necessarily a fine and wonderful thing. Manufacturing should be kept off American shores. Let the Europeans deal with it. We'll just provide them with goods. Uh, the Republicans were more comfortable with like the politics of the street, you know, actual what we now would call democracy. Federalists were uneasy with an active populist. Republicans were more comfortable with an active populist. Um, and so kind of along those lines, they favored France, which was at this point beginning to go through a revolution. Mm -hmm. And that revolution was largely about overthrowing royalty and having, you know, in some way, something more democratic than a monarchy. And so the Republicans moved in that direction. The thing I'll add at the end of this is, and I know this because of my students, I think a lot of people are taught in high school, Federalists versus Republicans, and I think I was, um, you go up to a blackboard and you draw a line down the middle and then you say Federalist one side and Republican the other side. And it's never that clear, right? And, and which is part of the interesting part of this time period is they kind of generally have a sense of what they want, but there are no clear lines. And no one's absolutely sure. Even, even Hamilton sometimes wonders, like, does Jefferson really think that? Or maybe he thinks something else. So part of the politics in this period is people really trying to figure out what people think and why. Is part of it too that it's still a fairly intimate, small circle of people involved? Um, that that you know, we obviously aren't at a point yet of having the, the mass population, mass communication of the era. There's a lot more personal interaction in the way that government and politics are conducted. And, and as you say, you know, you, you've got these some, sometimes shifting lines or uh, unclear definitions. Hamilton and Madison cooperate on the Federalists and on the idea of selling that, uh, that aspect of, uh, of government. And yet they do begin to diverge in, in those ways. But as you're saying, it's not always quite clear where one starts and where Depending the other Depending on the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So it's easy that you could imagine someone veering way off what you would assume they would do if there's an issue that touches that person in a personal way or a local way that you weren't counting on. So on the one hand, like you're saying, it's a, it's a more intimate world than we might think today. On the other hand, because people aren't coming to politics and saying, I am a Republican or I am a Federalist, they sometimes, Hamilton, one of the things he liked to do to figure out people's politics was find a way to call a vote of some kind in Congress because then people had to take a side. And then he could be like, okay, now I kind of know what sides people are on. So um, it, it was murkier than the blackboard with the line down uh, right. suggests. And you see that somewhat in Monroe's career. I mean, very much a, a, a partisan Republican. And again, we have to emphasize that we're, we're not talking to the Republicans of the later of the Lincoln era and later. We're talking about the Jeffersonian Republicans. Uh, and yet he saw the need for national expansion, a national vision for the government. Ultimately, even, the, even though he voted against ratification of the Constitution initially over issues like the Bill of Rights, he ultimately saw the need for that stronger centralized government he particularly would see that later in the wake of the War of 1812. So here's someone who is a, a very avowed Republican, 
sort of looking into the, the Federalist position, saying, you know, I, I could do with some of that. And that's a good point, is that ideas change over time. I mean, even, you know, Jefferson becomes president and he starts thinking, small scale manufacturing might not be so bad. So, yeah, you know, I mean. <laughs> Louisiana weird. might not be so bad. <laughs> that's right, too. And it, does, it isn't in the Constitution, but maybe that won't be so bad. Um, but no, that's an important point, too, is um, ideas evolve, situations change, and that's true for everyone, including that generation of people. So we've got the issues, we've got the events that go on, both domestic, external, that are, are defining something of the political debate and the, and the direction that our government, our foreign policy might go. But you have also written extensively on the role that personal reputation and honor played in the political discourse of this era. So how vital were these attributes uh, generally and how uh, would it have impacted or influenced leaders like Hamilton and Monroe and, and their peers? Well, it, it, the first thing it's important to know when you talk about honor is um, when I write about it, I'm not saying, ah, that entire generation was always honorable at all. I'm talking about honor in a more concrete kind of practical way. And particularly because partic in politics, these people weren't hiding behind a party label. They were resting, in a sense, on their reputation for people to trust them, for people to engage with them. Reputation and honor was essentially how you were elected to office. It was how people trusted you or didn't in their political machination. So it really mattered in a practical way for politicians. And they were elected based not on job skills, but on the fact that they had a good reputation. And if your reputation was wounded, not only might it hurt your career, but as the way they saw it, your manhood would be damaged. You would sort of be erased if you were a person who was dishonored and did nothing to redeem your honor. So honor was really important. I've written before that um, politics without parties is like a war without uniforms. So there, no one's quite sure. And honor and reputation end up being important ways to have how people view each other and then ultimately what they think is acceptable or not in politics. And so you know there are um, certain words you can't say and certain things you can't do uh, that affect congressional debate as much as they affect people out in the world. So it, it's, a, it's a concrete way of kind of regulating politicians. And they use it that way, right? They use the, the, the code of honor and honor in a really practical way. Like, ooh, if I say this, he's probably going to do that. And if I do it before this vote, it might do this. So they're, they're cagier and, and more strategic than we might think. And, and I think that's important to distinguish between conflicts that arise through the heat of the moment or heat of, 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 of a passionate debate or a personal affront, which obviously those things would play too. But this, as you say, there's a real calculation to this. And it's within an accepted, pretty much mutually understood landscape of, of, of almost a dance in a way. And everyone knows the steps. And right. a step in this direction does this, a step over here does that, or the language of the fan uh, yeah. of, the, of the colonial era. You know, you're, you're looking at these signals and everyone knows the code. And we don't, right? So the we, fun yeah, of studying yeah. this is like, someone does something and there's a freak out on the other side. <laughs> and us looking on, it's like, why? And, and that's the fun part as a historian. Then you have to figure out, okay, why? What's the freak out about? Which reveals there's some line being crossed there that we can't see. And that's part of the key to figuring out another time period. I think Franklin first wrote about the freak out, probably, uh, in his <laughs> uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. You know, <laughs> um, we've looked at the broad perspectives of the early republic's political landscape, and we've gotten into somewhat into the role that personal honor played in it. That's going to be important as we go into uh, a segment here in a moment in which we will be looking at um, some documents in the collection of the James Monroe Museum, assisted by uh, University of Mary Washington students who are interns here, and we'll have a chance to introduce them in just a moment, and they're going to have their own questions for Dr. Freeman, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. We're pleased to welcome to the table Ethan Nick and Cody Youngblood, who are Boley Scholar interns at the James Monroe Museum. They are both enrolled in the Historic Preservation Degree Program here at the University of Mary Washington, and they've brought several documents from the museum's collection that pertain to an episode of high drama involving James Monroe and Alexander Hamilton, and they've got some questions 
pertaining to that for Dr. Freeman. So, gentlemen, take it away. So, Dr. Freeman, could you please give us a brief overview of the Hamilton Reynolds affair and the near duel between Alexander Hamilton and James Monroe? I can, and it's a spicy story. It's a good story. Um, and it takes place in two different chunks of time in the 1790s. So, the first part of it is in the early 1790s, and a woman named Mariah Reynolds comes to visit Hamilton and says something along the lines of, I uh, hear you're a man who is charitable and likes to help people if they're in trouble and my husband's mistreating me, they're in Philadelphia, he's in New York. Uh, she says she wants to just get home uh, and needs money. And Hamilton says, um, I could do that, I could, I could loan you money, but I don't have cash on hand, I can find some and then I can bring it to your home this evening. So he does that and according to him, as he puts it later, he's shown up to her bedroom uh, and as he himself puts it, it quickly became apparent that more than pecuniary consolation would be acceptable, meaning more than the exchange of money is happening at that moment. Now, the husband of Mariah Reynolds begins blackmailing Hamilton, steps forward and says, I hear you're doing fishy things with my wife. You can keep doing the fishy things with my wife if you like, but you're going to pay me or I'm going to reveal this, this whole thing. So Hamilton makes these payments to James Reynolds and keeps doing fishy things with Mariah Reynolds, there are little slips of paper from Hamilton that are basically saying, I here I have a thousand dollars, like here I have two hundred dollars. And some of his political opponents, Republicans, begin to see these little documents and they think, oh, he's doing something fishy with treasury funds. Before we do anything, let's ask him what this means. So they go and they bring these documents. They're like, we seeing these slips of papers that suggest you're messing with treasury funds. Who, what are you doing and why? One of whom is Monroe. One of them is Monroe, and then there are two other, uh, Venable, I think, and Muhlenberg, a Pennsylvanian. So two Virginians and a Pennsylvanian. So thank you for the reminder. Um, and they ask him, and he says, I wasn't doing anything with treasury funds. I was committing adultery and being blackmailed. And he pulls out all of these you know, letters between him and Mariah Reynolds to prove to them. and. They're probably disappointed, but they believe him. He has the documents, and they all agree. No one will talk about it beyond that room. It'll be just between them and. Now advance a couple of years later, 1797, and a pamphlet comes out uh, in which it basically says, you know, there are these documents that are incriminating from Hamilton, and we need to talk about Hamilton and his politics and really kind of attacks him. Hamilton, seeing the pamphlet, immediately thinks, one of those three guys leaked. Like they were supposed to never say anything about what happened. Someone leaked information and now it's in public in a pamphlet. So here's where the Monroe part comes in. Hamilton wants all three guys to swear that they didn't leak the information because now Hamilton's honor's involved, right? Some fishy things are being said about him in public in a pamphlet. So he writes to all three guys and says, I want to hear from you whether or not you leaked this information. And two of them say, I did not. And Monroe says something hedgy, you know, well, I, it depends on what you mean by leak. And I, you know, he doesn't say no. So Hamilton then concludes, okay, like Monroe's the guy, Monroe leaked this information. So he writes a letter to Monroe. And at the time, if you were gonna be involved in an affair of honor that might become a duel, you first, you sent a form letter. And the form letter would basically say, um, I hear you said this about me. Um, uh, this clearly is an insult of some kind. Uh, did you say it? Did you mean it? Uh, and you, I expect a quick response because this has to do with my honor. If you get that kind of a letter, you would know, uh oh, I'm in trouble. So he sends this letter to Monroe that basically says, I am coming to see you on a matter of some importance to me and I'm bringing a friend. And a friend would have been his second right, in a duel. Monroe, getting this letter, would have immediately known, oh, okay, this is like not necessarily a duel yet, but it can be one. So he brings along his own friend, his second two, so that there are these two guys and their friends mm -hmm. standing by. Now, luckily for us, um, Monroe's second wrote down the conversation that happened just mm -hmm. to document it. And it's wonderful because it, mm -hmm. you don't often get to 
have a sense of what conversations sound like, right? You're always getting documents that are letters. This is a conversation. And so what you see is that Hamilton comes in and he's like being very lawyerly. He's like, okay, this is the problem that faces us. And he begins to first this and then this, and then this happened, and then you did this. And, and Monroe, they don't like each other. So Hamilton's like setting out a case and Monroe keeps saying, yeah, I know. I was there. Like, you don't have to do this, can we get to the point? And every time he interrupts Hamilton, Hamilton says, let me begin again, right? So this is, exactly, it's not going well. So there, Hamilton is getting irritated, Monroe is getting irritated, and then finally, um, Hamilton says, you know, I, I, I think that you might have leaked this pamphlet. Yeah. And Monroe says that he didn't, and Hamilton says, quote, that as your representation is totally false. Now, if you call Monroe a liar, instant duel, right? You call someone a liar or a coward, that's really serious. Hamilton doesn't use the L word. He mm. says, that as your representation is totally false. However, both men know what that means. So as soon as Hamilton says that, they both jump to their feet, right? Because now it's like a serious insult. And Monroe says, are you calling me a liar? I call you a scoundrel, which is another dueling word, right? So he's like, one up. And Hamilton says, fine, I am ready to meet you like a gentleman, meaning let's duel. And Monroe says, I am ready to get your pistols. And the two seconds step in and we're like, whoa, like, let's, let's talk about this, right? So that's this moment that happens in which um, the seconds quiet them down. What should have happened is that as soon as they felt insulted, they walked away and the seconds would have mediated between mm. them. And ultimately, mm. that's what happens. And the two guys are sending letters back and forth. The comical thing about this is um, neither one really wants to duel and neither one wants to back down. Mm. And so they keep exchanging letters that basically say, I don't want to really duel, but, I, but if you want to duel, I'm going to duel. And then the other one says, well, I'm, I'm not eager to duel, but if you want to duel, I'm... And so it, it shows you how much dueling at the time was something that people, these men felt compelled to do to uphold their manhood and reputations. Yeah. Well, nobody wanted to fight duels. Like, who yeah. wants to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a great example of that. But it's wonderful to, to see the conversation where you can watch them respond to the insults. Yes, absolutely. And I think we have one of those letters right here if you're interested in taking a look I, at of it. Of course. How could I not be interested? <laughs> there you go. So this one is a draft of one of the letters that Monroe wrote uh, and then he rewrote it and actually sent it to Alexander. It's a careful, le like it's an important letter. He has to, like every word matters, right? Mm -hmm. So it yes, makes yeah. perfect sense that there's multiple drafts. And he does not have bad handwriting, yeah. actually. Yeah. He was on his game that day. Usually his handwriting is terrible. So well, This would have been <laughs> he, an important letter. He so understood probably, how important yeah, it was. He did. Right? Yeah. He did. And this whole letter, it's like it was not my intention to invite or provoke a personal interview, meaning a duel. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, I thought that perhaps, you know, that's what you wanted, and if that's what you want, I won't turn it down. And there's mm -hmm. cross-outs and stuff going on here. So he's really trying to figure out how to uphold his honor, how to not seem cowardly by backing away from Hamilton, and how to not fight a duel all at the same yeah, time. So sense. it makes perfect sense that there are many drafts, because yeah. anyone facing a duel would have been a nervous person. Oh, yes. Now we have uh, the actual final letter he sent to Alexander Hamilton as well. Okay. That That's cool. Very down in here. And I have to say that one of the things about dueling documents, so this, this mm -hmm. speaks well to you folks here. It not, it's not necessarily that common that dueling documents survive because dueling was illegal. Mm -hmm. And so very often they would immediately afterwards, they might talk about it or even go to the newspaper and talk about it. But the actual documents, like only once in all the years I've researched, have I seen an actual challenge to a duel on paper. You mm -hmm. never wanted to keep that because then you could get Mm -hmm. You know, ooh, you did an illegal act and it's on paper. Yeah. So first of all, it's just cool that this correspondence is here. I know, yeah. Okay. There you are. Very cool. Sir. It's, it, and well, it's still very neat handwriting. Actually, neater handwriting. So now this is like maybe a more important thing because it's a final draft. Yes, yes. Um, again, still, it's not my intention to invite or provoke a personal interview because I had no motives for so doing and many, especially at the time, for avoiding it. Even the reference to what could happen as an interview. Right, exactly. Couches it in You terms never say of, dual. Yeah. That's precisely right. <laughs> interview is like, well, interview isn't illegal. It's, yeah. <laughs> what does interview mean anyway between hmm. gentlemen? So yeah, uh, and then he's going on with, uh, you know, I'm not gonna, 
I don't know if you meant a challenge or an invitation or an advance, and with me all of those mean the same thing, and I, you know, it seems like that's what you're saying, but maybe that's not what you're saying. Yes. Were you saying that? This is a great dueling letter because it shows the reality of the strangeness and the complications and the weirdness and the danger um, and the fact in which you know we romanticize this kind of stuff so much, right? Like, ooh, dueling. And it was important, it was ritualized, but nobody wanted to fight a duel. They're dangerous, right? Yeah. No one wants mm -hmm. to die. So that's all kind of captured in this, this wonderful correspondence, and it's great that, that you have that here. And given, too, that we're talking about Monroe and Alexander Hamilton, Yes. the one uh, evolution that occurs from draft to final letter is the reference to the second, or, or an implied reference to the second. And in the draft, it's none other than Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr. So for, right, it, he makes it clear in the letter that in some way or another, Burr is going to be delivering letters between them. I've given Burr permission to do X. Burr doesn't end up being his formal second, but he's clearly a go-between. So, you know, in the long view of history, it's like, wait a minute. First of all, Hamilton and Monroe almost fought a duel. So normally all by itself, people mm -hmm. go, really? And you say, yeah, and Aaron Burr was kind of a go-between. That's just like you would think someone made that up, right? Yeah. In the long view of history, like sounds like a great plot for a movie, but really, or a musical, or <laughs> <laughs> really, you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. very well, thank cool. You. Very interesting. Well, going back to the uh, Reynolds pamphlet, that was a rather bold attempt by Hamilton to express his side of the story. Now, how effective do you think that was at swaying public opinion? The Reynolds pamphlet, um, that was a dramatic thing to do. So. Hamilton wants to clear his name and he wants to prove that he's not messing with treasury funds, that he's a good public servant. And in his mind, he decides the way to clear his reputation. And people sometimes publish pamphlets to clear their name. Um, and they would put all kinds of evidence at the back. Like, I, this is what really happened and here's all the evidence. Hamilton does that regarding this. But what that means is he writes a pamphlet that says, I'm being accused of misusing treasury funds but actually I was committing adultery. <laughs> and he goes into great detail about the adulterous affair to prove that's what he was doing. He wasn't being corrupt. And he includes the letters between him and Mariah Reynolds in the back as an appendix and puts this out into the world, basically saying, you can trust me as a public servant. I'm an adulterer, I'm an excellent public servant. Right? <laughs> kind of an interesting message. So it is, it gets a lot of attention, right? It's kind of a blockbuster pamphlet in a sense because people are like, what, like really? Ultimately, it doesn't really necessarily do very much, except suggest to his friends that he's the kind of guy who writes potentially dangerous, unthought-out pamphlets. Right? People are like, that, that, really? Was that good? We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the course of his life, he writes another one, and where at that point his friends say, yeah, OK, we can't really fully trust him with a pen at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have a huge influence, except for making people kind of look mm -hmm. at, at Hamilton and giving them something spicy to talk about. So we have here a copy of the Reynolds pamphlet, if you'd like to take a look at that. Of course I would like to take a look at that. OK. This is, this is a copy of the Reynolds pamphlet. I'm holding this up because Hamilton musical people, this is an original copy of the Reynolds pamphlet. Um, so that's, that's the actual document there in which he's revealing himself to the public um, and not getting really much of an impact for it. I mean, it's, you know, if you look at it, it it's kind of thick, right? He's, 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 got, he's Hamilton, he's got a lot to say. And at the end, uh, are in an appendix, are all of the letters back and forth. But, you know, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. And, and the enduring popularity of this, this, the copy we have in the James Renault Museum is actually not the original edition. This thing kind of kept coming around again and again, didn't it? it? Did. And there's a specific... Anyone who wants to smack at Hamilton at any point could go to this. And in this case, this is an edition that came out in 1800. And the reason it came out was because the election of 1800 was a big deal. And so whoever was responsible for this, just thought, not, now might be an excellent time for another edition of the Reynolds pamphlet. That'll really get to him. Free. So, yeah. Pro bono. Pro bono, yeah. right? We just, we're just throwing it out there. So yeah, this was, this was a version of it that was like, well, Hamilton did this a couple of years ago, and it was really stupid. So let's put it out there again. I'm sure he was thrilled at that. Not. <laughs> well, we also have another copy here, and this one concerns the character of John Adams. Ooh, OK. Now see, Hamilton, as I suggested a few minutes ago, um, had a reputation for writing pamphlets that he shouldn't write. Um, and for writing things that he shouldn't write, right? He's not very good at controlling what he's saying or what he's writing. 
in this case, and I'll take this out again, um, this is uh, a letter from Alexander Hamilton concerning the public conduct and character of John Adams, President of the United States. And I'll hold that up and then put that here. Um, in this case, a couple of years later, election of 1800, really big deal. Adams is a Federalist, Hamilton is a Federalist. They don't like each other very much. And so Hamilton writes this probably assuming that if he can just get some people to back away from Adams and support Pinckney, the other fellow who is supposedly running for vice president, right? maybe he can make the election like twist a little so that the guy who becomes president is a Federalist he likes rather than John Adams. John Adams also publicly, or with friends at least, had smacked at Hamilton and said he was essentially a British agent, which Hamilton didn't like. So they're at a bad point. Hamilton writes this letter. Now, interestingly, he writes um, to a lot of his friends. And he doesn't often seek advice, but he writes to a lot of his friends. And he says, I'm thinking of writing this letter and it's gonna be attacking Adams, and I'm gonna make it look like I'm defending my character, but really, I'm gonna be attacking him so that we can make him a little less popular. And the friends, before they respond to him, write to each other. And in their letters to each other, they're basically saying, I'm not gonna tell him it's a stupid idea. You tell him it's a stupid <laughs> idea. And finally, one guy, uh, I believe his name George Cabot, steps forward and says, I'll tell him it's a dumb idea. He's never gonna to talk to me again, but I'll tell him it's a dumb idea. And, and it doesn't matter because he, goes ahead and publishes it anyway. Um, and this did end up having a, a big impact, not necessarily on Adams or the election, but on Hamilton. Because here it is, I mean, you just think about this, presidential election and some guy comes forward and he's a guy with an important national reputation and he writes a pamphlet attacking the main presidential candidate of his own party, telling all of these horrible things about Adams. And then at the end, there's this bizarre sentence that says basically, and now that I've said all that, you know, really we should vote for him. Like somehow he thought that that was gonna add up to something logical, which it doesn't. So this, by this point, this hurts his career. And um, some of his uh, friends are saying things to each other like, the man has no discretion, right? He, basically he's a loose cannon. He's really not someone we should be following anymore. So this does not have a huge impact on the election. Unfortunately for Hamilton, it affects him. I actually have, a really small collection of, of, of like documents and things from the period. And part of it I call the Stupid Pamphlets Hamilton Wrote Collection. <laughs> and I have a copy of each of these because they're really, they were not the best things he ever did. Hmm. But definitely spicy and interesting. Just as an aside, and we've got more to probe on the, the Hamilton Reynolds intersection here with Monroe, but just to show how interrelated and, and overlaying some of these things are, uh, John Adams is involved in this in the sense of, of what Hamilton is writing about. And in the same general time frame as Monroe and Hamilton are working through this dual process, John Adams and James Monroe come into conflict politically when Adams criticizes Monroe's performance as ambassador to France. Mm -hmm. He comes home recalled in apparent disgrace and Adams makes some comments which prompt Monroe to think about challenging him to a duel. And so in this same general you know, period of time, late 1790s going into the 1800 period, James Monroe is at the nexus of two potential duels with people that are, are uh, uh, intersecting with all the other web of people they know and, and, and work with the government at this time. And it's, it's fascinating to think of him being at the center of these um, and they didn't occur. And, and the, the possibility of what could happen if they had, of course, is fantastic. But we're fortunate that we can sort of see through the documents um, some of the evidence of, of what's going on and uh, get a little look at the character of Monroe. But going back, um, as, as I, Cody has some more. I totally okay. have to right. weigh in only because the document where Monroe says he might challenge Adams to a duel is totally worth quoting, right? So he, writes to, he, he writes to James Madison. He's like, I feel insulted. I need to do something and I don't know what to do. This is actually a letter that, that launched my first book because he lists all the things he could do to redeem his reputation. He says, well, okay, so I could challenge him to a duel, but I shouldn't because, and this is almost a quote, he's an old man and the president. <laughs> it's like, good logic, James yeah. Monroe. Sorry, James Monroe. Um, so yeah, then he goes on. He says, I could write a pamphlet against him. I could you know, speak publicly against him. He lists basically a list of weapons he can use to attack Adams' character. When I read that letter, I was like, oh, wait a minute, he's got like a little arsenal in his brain of weapons, and dueling is one of them. And that was the idea that launched my first book, that they all had like a landscape of fighting 
that we hadn't noticed before, but I, I thank, thank you, James Monroe, looking over our shoulders because his letter was the one that made me realize this was, was the case. He, he said you're welcome. Yeah. Okay, that's excellent. <laughs> okay, now you were going to go back to questions. Yeah, I believe you were going to get oh, further right. in into the... And I'll put this away. Yes. So in their correspondence regarding this whole dual scenario, neither Monroe or Hamilton uh, decided to back down. So how much was this an actual legitimate challenge to a duel rather than just gesturing? So that's a great question because um, the short answer is it was not a challenge to a duel, mm -hmm. right? Because if there had been a challenge, a formal challenge, then there would really have to be serious negotiations. It mm -hmm. never gets beyond the, you know, you, if you want to do it, I'll do it. If you want to do it, I'll do it. it. It's the lead up to a challenge. But in a sense, it is posing and posturing, but that's a big part of dueling culture, right? Because in one way or another, whether you fight the duel or whether you're negotiating, in one way or another, you're trying to show that you are a brave man who is willing to die for your honor, which means I'm willing to duel to defend my name and reputation. Mm. They don't have to go to a dueling ground to do that. They can just sort of pose and exchange these letters. Mm. There are a lot of um, affairs of honor. They, they don't make it to duels, but I, I call them affairs of honor because they're like these exchanges of letters in which each side is like saying, you know, well, here's what I think, and the other one says, well, no, I, you know, and they, they posture and pose yeah. and people negotiate. And if they come out of that having demonstrated they're willing to duel and then finding a way out, the duel doesn't have to happen, but they've done what they needed to do. Yeah. And, and in a sense, that's kind of what hap is happening here between Monroe and Hamilton. Yeah. Very neat, thank you. Now, do you ever believe that um, Hamilton truly accepted Monroe's word that he never leaked uh, the documents of the investigation? I mean, that, that's, you know, as a historian, I'm supposed to say, I have not seen the evidence. Um, it is not my sense that he believed that because someone had to leak it. And if two people said no, and Monroe basically, until pushed, didn't say no, one would think that he continued to blame him. But that he doesn't, there's no, like, letter afterwards in which, you know, he's like, and that darn Monroe, you know, I knew. From, so he never really talks about it. His wife totally blames Monroe for revealing this and making, making Hamilton write the pamphlet. She totally uh, never forgives him. And actually there's a maybe anecdotal story from years later. So Elizabeth Hamilton, and Hamilton musical people will totally know that you know, he dies and she lives on decades without him. And uh, late in her life, she's living in Washington and James Monroe comes to visit her and essentially says something like, you know, there aren't many of us left from this early generation, and I just thought I would pay a call. This is ex-president James Monroe. And so he's, he's doing a gracious thing. And Elizabeth Hamilton says, if you think that because we're one step away from the grave that I forgive you for what you did, I do not. And she turns her back mm. and walks out of the room, right? So clearly the Hamiltons assumed that, that was, he had something to do with it, and she mm. held that grudge for decades. So yeah, uh, one last question, if you would oblige us. Uh, Monroe, Hamilton, if they had dueled and uh, one of the other had been killed, would the victorious dueler um, have suffered? Would their reputation have suffered? Could that have ended uh, their political career, perhaps? It's a great question because it's logical to assume that dueling is about killing, mm -hmm. right? And you go fight a duel, which means these two guys want to kill each other because why else would you travel to a field with guns and shoot at each other, right? And it isn't about killing, it's about being willing to die. Hmm. So when you look at duels, and in particular duels between politicians in this period, the vast majority of them, either no one gets shot or like leg wounds, mm -hmm. shin wounds were really popular. Mm -hmm. They aren't trying to kill each other. And in the duels where someone does get killed, it makes the person who did the killing politically vulnerable. His enemies can gang up and say, you know, murderer, murderer, and normally that person has to leave town, and um, sometimes personally he has a problem with the fact that he just killed somebody. Mm -hmm. So when you kill someone in a duel, in a sense, you could very well be the loser. So right. it's totally possible in this case that if one had killed the other, the friends of the person who was dead could have stepped forward and said, you are a murderer, look what you've done, and you know, this is a man with children, and whatever they needed to do to make the other one look bad. It could have been that that would have been a stain, a blot on the reputation of the other that might have done something to their career. I mean, it's impossible to know, but it's the important part of that question is, 
um, you can't assume, you have to actually not assume that whoever did the killing would be victorious because that yeah. probably wouldn't be the case. Makes sense. Thank you. Makes kind of a weird sense in dueling land. Indeed, right? yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Cody and Ethan, thank you very much. Um, we will take another brief break and then wrap up this fascinating conversation. Um, when you delivered the James Monroe Lecture here in 2018, thank you, by the way, and, and you're welcome because after that came MSNBC and speaking to Congress and all <laughs> it that. It all so started. Again, here. you're welcome, yeah. <laughs> um, your remarks were titled Dirty, Nasty Politics in James Monroe's America, which I want to say is one of the best titles I've ever heard. <laughs> Our conversation today has been touching on a lot of those kinds of elements and how those politics influence the careers of people like Hamilton and Monroe. And politics then could be very dirty and nasty, and as you've written, violent. It almost got violent for our guys. And those elements keep surfacing over and over, it seems, in our political history, almost from the beginning. And I think without going into detail, it's fair to say that we still see some of those really highly negative and divisive traits, sometimes leading to violence, in our contemporary political discourse. So how have we, as a body politic, work through those dirty, nasty, violent eras in the past, and does it tell us something about how we might look at our way forward in our, our politics and in our society? So it's, I have to say, you know, we're obviously in a really polarized moment right now. As a historian who focuses on politics and polarization and conflict and violence, it's always interesting during a moment like this to be someone who knows about it in the past and then is sort of watching things happen and thinking, huh, <laughs> like, I know what happened the last three times this happened. So on the one hand, um, that's part of the answer to your question, which is this is certainly not the first moment that we've had extremely polarized politics where people are clashing about, really clashing about what their vision of what America should be. It's not 1860. It's not or, 1968. Right, you know, or the 1790s, 1790, yeah, yeah. right? So you can march through American history and pinpoint moments in which really there are two clear sides who kind of are accusing the other side of not being American in some way. So mm -hmm. that's a tradition, right? And that's partly attached to a democratic politics that can flow in that way and move back and forth. There's, you, I mean, this is part of what the Federalists were nervous about, right? A democratic mm -hmm. politics seemingly uncontrolled, like who knows what the public will do. Well, right, that's the yeah. freedom and the glory. Democracy was not a, a necessarily uh, positive term no. used in that context. There, no, right? at yeah. this time period it was not a positive term because it meant uncontrolled mass participation in a way that kind of freaked out, certainly mm -hmm. the Federalists. But, but so the, the glory of a democratic politics is also the vulnerability of a democratic politics, mm -hmm. which is the fact that it can go all over the place. So on the one hand, you can be in this present moment and look back and say, Okay, like we've had moments like this before, and often when I'm chatting with people, that comes up, and then they'll, they'll say something like, you know, so I feel so much better about the present because this has happened before and we came out of it. But that's the other half of the equation. No two moments are the same, mm. so you can't look at past moments and say, well, here's what happens next. Who knows what's going to happen next? So it's on the one hand somewhat comforting to know that we've been through this before. On the other hand, it's really important to bear in mind that. Um, history doesn't repeat, you know, kind of echoes, but it doesn't repeat. Uh, and it doesn't allow you to predict the future. It allows you to talk intelligently about the trend of what's happening and the roots of it. And that's an important thing that people don't think about that is good for people to think about now. People are very present minded generally, and they think, oh, now we're in this moment and it's a problem. But of course, a big part of that problem has very deep roots. You know, just look at the problem of race in America. Right? That's not a now That's another problem. show, by the way. That is yeah. another show. But that's, that's it, the moment we're having now has extremely deep roots. And to understand where we are now and why we're there now on that issue or any number of other issues, you have to go pretty far back in time to understand how events built and what kinds of systems and assumptions were built in to the way America runs. So history, in that sense, you can't really fully understand the here and now without understanding how you got here, right? And so, you know, that's historians. People always want historians to predict the future, like, well, you've studied the past, of course you must know. No, but I can tell you a lot 
about traditions and ideas and actions and people who helped get us to this point. And now that we know that, we can look at the present in an informed kind of a way and think about what we want to come next. People often will say, usually in response to hearing something that they don't, perhaps don't necessarily agree with, um, that you can't change history. My feeling has always been, history always changes because it's written from the perspective of whoever is doing the looking. Facts, <clears throat> for the most part, we think probably are facts. Um, but it, it is always going to be viewed through a prism of, of a lot of different factors that are particular to the moment, to the individual, to the society. And for you as an historian, um, you know, I know that you immerse yourself in the subjects upon which you write, particularly early revolutionary, early national revolutionary period, um, the honor culture of dueling. That, that has been the bread and butter of, of what a lot of your career has been. And you even describe in, in uh, Affairs of Honor how you went out with a, uh, a police uh, sharpshooter and got all masked and gloved and everything and, 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 and got all the protective body armor on and fired a dueling pistol. You, know, you got the ultimate experience. I think Ozzy Osbourne was probably inspired by you when he did his show and <laughs> fired a musket at Colonial Williamsburg. Was, I truly never thought about that. Yeah, that, see, once <laughs> and again. I probably will yeah. never think about it again. But, but I mean, that's, that's really going the extra mile to, to, to immerse yourself in the subject. And it, it reminded me of what Faulkner wrote that the past is never dead, it's not even past. And, and that's a really vivid expression of that. But most people are not historians. At least not, they wouldn't necessarily identify themselves. We're all historians in a way if we remember anything in our past experience or our family history, whatever. But for you, and you are, I think you, you fundamentally identify yourself as a teacher, um, all these other things, but at the core of it is teaching. It's trying to impart teaching the lessons. Teaching students and teaching the public, yeah. Exactly. So, and you've touched on it some, but just the, the process of, of accomplishing this way of taking history and, and providing, I, I guess, a relevance a context for it to audiences, whether in the classroom or elsewhere. How do you approach that and, and, and what, what do you think it means for us in, in trying to find some grounding of, of our current existence and where we might go? What, what does studying the past really do for us and, and how do you get that across? Well, you know, this is an interesting moment in time to ask that question because um, any moment in American history where something's happening that doesn't happen very often the first thing people do is say, well, how was this done before, right? So we've, we're going through all of this polarized politics, there's the whole impeachment stuff going on. And of course, this has been a, a history flooded moment because even on a practical level, what people have been asking is, well, what happened last time we did this? Well, well what does it mean that this happened the last time we did this? And as a matter of fact, what did the founders think impeachment was supposed to do? And as a matter of fact, well, you know, so you could keep asking those questions. People were asking those questions not because they were interested in history, but because they were really seeking practical guidance. And where else do you look but the past? So certainly this moment is an interesting time to, and an easy moment to stress that, that history means something. Um, but I think, you know, there are trends in American history, broad trends in American history. There are ideals and goals that we really haven't met necessarily that often, but sometimes we have. Mm -hmm. There are um, things that America is supposed to stand for, and again, perhaps hasn't lived up to that, but can work towards. All of those things are part of who we are. So if we're in a moment like the present moment and we're really debating who we are, that kind of information becomes practical and add to that the fact that we can see right now people trying to grab hold of the past so that it says what they want them to say, right? But politically minded people shaping- Across history. the spectrum. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Shaping the past so that it does what they want it to do. And this, you know, as someone who studies the founders, people do that all the time. You know, they, uh, you get a founder quote, you can make it mean whatever you want, and then you've got Thomas Jefferson or George Washington on your side, and boy, it's good. Mm -hmm. So, but you can really see in this moment uh, and I always tell my students that they will now permanently go insane whenever they listen to political dialogue because now they'll be able to see that, right? That, hey, wait a minute, I read that letter in class and that's not what it meant. It's like, You're right, that's not what it meant. So that's the other thing is that people use history in all kinds of interesting ways. And if you can point to that and then say to people, hey, wait a minute, like, let's, let's talk about that. What does it mean that they're using it? 
and what, is th what can we tell about really what it might have initially meant, how it's changed over time. So this is a moment when history has a really, really practical value. I mean, it's interesting just generally in the public sphere, you know, historians are all over the place. You know, they're on cable news shows, they're writing endless uh, op-eds in the newspaper, they're, you know, all over social media, you know, I'm mm -hmm. on social media. Yeah. Um, they're doing it not because they're jumping up and down with excitement, they're listening to me, but it's because <laughs> this is a moment Oh, it's history. a little bit that, right? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, like 10%. <laughs> okay. but, but the other 90% is, it, it, this is such an important moment, and what we have to say matters in such mm -hmm. a big way. I, you know, I'm on social media all the time talking about the Constitution, right, talking about why are there three separate branches? You know, what, what are checks and balances and why are they important? What did, what, I was on social media talking about impeachment and all kinds of things, right, that are seemingly elementary but are not elementary because people don't know about them. So I stepped forward and did that not because I thought, excellent, I get to talk <laughs> about the Constitution now. I realized I did that once and all of these people responded by saying, hey, I never knew that. And then I thought, whoa, you, People really need to know these sorts of things if they're in this moment. So the, the historians and historical teaching has a really practical value that I think is a little alarming to some historians, but it's really interesting to be one of many people who are stepping into that place and really trying to inform people and get people to think about implications and roots and to really understand the moment better. The James Renaud Museum, as we've said, is part of the University of Mary Washington, and so there's a nexus there of historical interpretation and the educational mission of the university. And in James Monroe's writings, we find him saying at one point that because we are in a popular you know, sovereign government where the people are the sovereigns, that the education of youth is a matter of the first importance. He also would say later that if the public is not informed, if they are not making their choices of their leaders, of, of what they support and the actions the government would do on an informed basis, they in a sense become the mob that is feared. So he saw the correlation between education and enlightened citizenship. And do you feel that that is still the mission we have, that we, we are better citizens if we are better informed? And, and does the teaching of history, I think you know, probably know the answer you're going to give, <laughs> does the teaching of history help support that goal to make us better citizens? Right, and, and, and talking about deep roots, that has very deep roots, that idea. And the, the <clears throat> logic of that during the founding era is that what was being founded here was obviously not a monarchy, but a republic. And as you just suggested, a republic is grounded on public opinion to an extreme degree. The public really shapes and influences things far, to a far greater degree than they can in a monarchy. But what that means is that the public has to be informed has to understand how things work, have to be able to recognize threats to the republic. There are all kinds of ways in which the public needs to be educated. There's a reason why, I mean, Jefferson was very big on this idea. He wanted everyone to have at least three years of education so they could understand and recognize threats to the republic. It was practical, there was a very mm -hmm. practical use to it. So in a republic, and in, in a democratic republic, it's important for citizens to have that kind of historical and civic understanding. And I do think um, we've been sort of pushing aside history and, and civics mm -hmm. in a general way in education. And sometimes I look at our current moment and I think, yeah, well, we need to invite it back in because it really matters. It really matters. And we're living through a moment when people really need to understand what's happening and why it's important. And, and they, they shouldn't be drifting through this moment. They should be thinking as citizens about what they feel is right and what it means and how it shapes who we are. And you can only get that by understanding how things work and understanding how we got here. Joanne Freeman, thank you very much for being with us again uh, here in Fredericksburg. And please know you are welcome back anytime. I would be happy to come anytime. Thank you. And to our viewers, on behalf of the James Monroe Museum and the University of Mary Washington, thanks for watching.